We're living in a world that is increasingly fraught with arguments, with upset, with um, high thoughts. In other words, ideas that are far beyond what we actually know. People have opinions about everything. And very often these opinions are intended to be inflammatory and to set about to stir up upset and angst. And I think of the verse uh, where the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and he says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I want to talk a little bit with you today about um, Joffrey Bull. Joffrey Bull, this is a book called When Iron Gates Yield. Joffrey Bull was a British missionary. Uh, he was saved as a boy and um, I think born in 1921. Uh, he originally had thought he might go into banking. He was a very disciplined man, uh, but the Lord led him to uh, travel into the, the mountains of Tibet with the gospel. Uh, he went with a, a Scottish missionary, um, and these two men um, spent, I think, about three years on the Chinese border, of the Golden Sands River, which is the north end of the Yangtze. The Yangtze is the longest river in China. And just to the west of that river was the land of Tibet. And so they lived in this region for about three years, learning uh, the Chinese language as well as the Tibetan language and the Tibetan culture, making contacts within Tibet. And eventually uh, they crossed over into the land of Tibet. Um, George Patterson, he traveled to the southern part of the country um, near the Indian border, but uh, Joffrey Bull went up into the region of Lhasa. And uh, this is the story of Joffrey Bull's experience there. And after only a few years, uh, the, there was a civil war as you know, after the Second World War, there was a civil war in China between the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek and the communist forces of Mao Zedong. And uh, as the nationalists eventually were routed and fled, most of them to Taiwan, the Chinese communists moved up uh, towards the Tibetan border and eventually crossed over. And Joffrey Bull went as a translator for the commander of the forces in that region, the nationalist forces, and he himself was taken and uh, was treated as a British spy and placed in solitary confinement for three years. And during that time, he had uh, great searchings of soul as he was put through indoctrination, um, brainwashing, as they sought to uh, re-educate him, so to speak. And um, many of the Christians thought that he had died, and they didn't know where he was. George Patterson escaped over the mountains, um, the Tibetan mountains, over the Himalayas, into India on a route that everyone thought was impassable, but somehow he was able to escape. Uh, but um, the Christians, they thought that maybe Joffrey Bull had been shot and he lived every day with that threat from the communists that any day he could die. Uh, but as it turned out, there was a Chinese uh, lady who was uh, working in the laundry of the prison and she came across a shirt with Joffrey Bull's name on it and through this made some inquiries and discovered that he was alive and the news came out through the Chinese church uh, through the Christians, eventually to the West. And Christians from five continents prayed for this man. When I was a little boy, I remember very clearly uh, how my parents and the Christians in, in our area gathered to pray uh, for the deliverance of Joffrey Bull. When I was a young man in my late teens, we traveled to hear 
Joffrey Bull speak. And I was deeply moved by the message he presented. We're going to put a link uh, down at the bottom here uh, in which Joffrey Bull tells his own story. It's about almost an hour and a half. It is well worth it. I'm not sure if you're ready. <laughs> I don't know I was ready when I listened to it again and realized the, the sharp edge of the sword of the Spirit cutting into my heart. But as he speaks about how the Lord put him through the crucible in that, in that solitary cell, God does a deep work in your heart as you listen to this. And so it's a great privilege for us in the 21st century to be able to hear from his own lips uh, the story of Joffrey Bull as he spent that time in a Chinese communist a prison camp. As I said, there were, he was a, a prolific writer, wrote a lot of very beautifully well-written books. Uh, this book, When Iron Gates Yield, is autobiographical, telling the story of his time in Tibet. Uh, then he wrote a book called God Holds the Key, which is a beautiful reminder that, that whatever circumstances we're in, we are prisoners of Jesus Christ. We're not prisoners of Rome, prisoners of Caesar. It's the Lord who holds the key to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And that's a devotional book. Uh, the Sky is Red, uh, Coral in the Sand. After uh, he was released from China, uh, made it back to Britain, married a Scottish lady. Uh, they were in Australia, I think, a year. And then uh, they served the Lord for a number of years in North Borneo. And I think that book tells some of those stories. And there's another book called Tibetan Tales, um, Forbidden Land, A Sag of Tibet, and so on. He's written books on the prophet Joan and the book of Ruth and elsewhere. So I'm sure you can find these used books on ABE books or something like that. Beautifully written. Long paragraphs. You have to get used to that, but very well written. So let me just read a couple of paragraphs out of this book to give you a taste of it. And to see this principle of taking circumstances and lifting them up to heaven, bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. Now he tells about uh, the Chinese New Year approaching and the, the very uh, disturbing religious activities of the Lamas at that time and what, what was involved in the idolatrous worship of the Tibetan people. But he writes, Inside the smoke-ridden dungeon of a place, I was now received with smiles and buttered tea by Pa Shamba, his wizened old face crinkled with pleasure as he motioned me to sit down on some old sheepskins spread on the earthen floor. His wife joins them, and uh, he says, We sipped the greasy but refreshing liquid from the dirty wooden bowls. As they sat there, he says, suddenly the old man turned to me and murmured, half confidentially, I want to ask you a question, and somehow don't like asking those Lama fellows. The Lama was a Buddhist priest. Do you think you can answer me? Without waiting for my reply, he went on speaking with increasing seriousness. At last it came. How big is a man's soul? He asked quietly. I looked into the fire and then into his worn and quizzical face. A soul, I replied, is measured like the wind, not by its length and breadth or even its height, but by its power. Only as a soul is linked with the eternal spirit of the living and true God can it grow to any size. How often I had thought of that arresting phrase, hell is no vastness, it is full of little rotting souls. I suppose if we viewed the lake of fire materially, 
it would be no bigger than a pinhead, and yet able to contain all the millions who have shriveled themselves in alienation from their Creator and Redeemer. Well, a few pages on, he tells about some of these activities at the Chinese New Year and how they had uh, built a huge pile of prepared timber and evergreens and how the llama came and lit this bonfire. Well, the wind roared through the blazing branches, he said, driving the smoke here and there up the valley in unremitting fury. From this dismal scene of superstition and idolatry, I wandered sadly up the square before the family shrine near the big house. Then he tells that suddenly an awful cry went up. It was as if the judgment of God had fallen. There is a house on fire. There's a house on fire, someone yelled. This activity in which they were uh, burning in effigy, evil spirits supposedly, was a, a time when using music they caused the people to submit themselves to the evil forces of darkness for another year. And so here now the houses had caught fire. He says only minutes and one whole block of some half dozen houses were aflame from end to end. Rapidly the fire swept on, and in a minute or two the place was gutted. The conflagration spread so fast that two women were trapped in the quadrangle in the center of the houses. There was only one main entrance, and this was now blocked with flame. It was fearful for them. One escaped over the roof, but the other, with that incredible courage given in the face of death, plunged out through the flames. The burns covered most of the skin of the upper part of her body. He goes on to describe it. It's, it's not pretty. But uh, both George Patterson and Joffrey Bull took some training in medicine, and they were the only medical help in this whole region. And so he says, for about 10 days, I literally fought for her life. And in the end, God graciously brought her through. All she could say every time she saw me was, but for you, I should be dead. And then Joffrey Bull takes this thought, and as we read, he brings it into captivity to Christ. He says, it was a lesson to me of the attitude I should always have towards my Savior who has delivered me from the eternal flames. To look into the face of the Lord Jesus and to say, but for you, I should be dead. Well, I, I just pray that uh, those of you who are exercised in your soul, it will take some, some deep stirring in your heart to listen to this message from Joffrey Bull as he probes our hearts, as his own heart was probed in solitary confinement there under the threat of death for over three years. But I trust the Lord will richly bless you. There are many very encouraging thoughts and certainly the purification process of listening to that message, though it takes almost an hour and a half, will be well worth it. If you could find time, get yourself a cup of your favorite and sit and let the Lord speak to your heart. I'm sure you will be deeply blessed and deeply encouraged by it. So, Joffrey Bull, my privilege to introduce him to you and trust the Lord will continue using him. He, being dead, yet speaks uh, through the ministry that the Lord gave him. <music>